Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation, Integrating Counseling and Horticultural Therapy. Uh, my name, as you can see from the title slide, is Scott Patterson and I attend Walsh University, but I am also a uh, high school biology teacher. I've taught at my uh, alma mater high school actually for uh, 16 years. I'm on the board of two different nonprofits uh, in my local community. One is called the Science Play Initiative. The other one is uh, called Community Roots. And my work at Community Roots is what has in part um, inspired this presentation. Um, we have a horticultural center down there that we have been rehabbing over the last uh, six or seven years. And we do a lot of outreach in our community. And part of that is now starting to include uh, some horticultural therapy and some services for people for whom uh, horticultural therapy would be a really beneficial treatment modality. As a high school teacher, of course, I have to uh, have my learning objectives here on the board up front. So uh, by the end of this presentation, we should all have a pretty good understanding of the basics of horticultural therapy with a focus on improving standardization with respect to different protocols and interventions. And I uh, will also be giving you guys a little bit of an update on some of the more recent research with respect to uh, working with veterans and also people with substance use disorders. Uh, this presentation also serves as a call to action to uh, increase the amount and quality of research that are in this field. You can see right here I have a QR code that you can go ahead and scan if you'd like a copy of the handout or you just go to the short little link that is up there <laughs> near image for the camera. Um, this is a live document. It'll take you straight to Google Doc and as I uh, continue to improve my knowledge in the subject, the uh, document will continue to improve as well. Let's talk with a uh, quick chat about what horticultural therapy is not. Because a lot of people do know that working in the garden or even being in different green spaces and outdoors can be a very uh, therapeutic experience. That is uh, not what we call horticultural therapy. We would call that therapeutic horticulture. Um, horticultural therapy is more of an active process and it involves the utilization along with the help of a registered horticultural therapist. Uh, usually it incurs as an integrative approach so that's something that we can add on to existing mental health treatment protocols for example uh, more of a traditional talk therapy or even blending it with whatever the theoretical orientation of the counselor would be uh, for example CBT has been found to work really well with uh, horticultural therapy added on to it and it involves use of horticulture as a means to achieve wellness uh, deliver occupational therapy and or drive a rehabilitation so it can be sort of an add-on or you can pick specific interventions and incorporate that as a part of the therapeutic experience and as you can see from the uh, sort of model that's shown on the screen that was uh, made by Holler you can see that you know like in counseling we've got the client sort of in the center and we've got our counselor or therapist and our goals and our plant sort of all in a nice ring around the outside showing that there is this impact from all of these different sources on the client uh, horticultural therapy has been found to help improve overall wellness with respect to physical and emotional health. Uh, that's from 2 2022. Uh, it's also been empirically validated as helpful in a wide range of counseling applications, including working with clients who are affected by depression, psychosis, and schizophrenia. That's from a, a little bit older study, a meta analysis by Clathworthy published in 2013. Uh, horticultural therapy has been found to lower cortisol levels and increase serotonin levels and has been studied as a method for stress reduction according to Detweiler et al. in 2015. So there are some common goals uh, found within horticultural therapy. These are sort of enveloping and of course uh, the goals can always be customized 
on a per client basis, uh, either collaboratively with an LPC or other mental health practitioner, or just between the uh, horticultural therapist and the client as again, an additive or integrative type of service. Overall, common goals involved in horticultural therapy, improving and increasing cognitive function, especially with respect to understanding your directions, following steps and procedures, and also uh, communicating with others. Because gardening is physically intensive, uh, involves, you know, doing activities, it's also very helpful for improving mobility and flexibility. Uh, it can be good for developing or practicing self-care, especially for those who need help with their independent living, uh, things like cleanliness, dressing yourself, dressing appropriately for the task you'll be doing, uh, eating, preparing food, and also improving interpersonal skills through collaborative gardening and interacting with others. One thing that's really nice about an HT program is uh, when you are done with it as a participant, uh, very often you may have tangible products. Even if you don't get to take any of the plants home with you or any of the produce that you may have harvested during your time, you still have something tangible you can look at and point to and say, yeah, yeah I, I helped do that or I did that. That can increase your sense of self-efficacy. That's from Sue et al. in 2020. Because HT focuses on the process, not the yield. So you still have a chance to increase your sense of self-efficacy, even if you don't get to go home with something. That being said, it is very often to include getting to take plants or produce home as a part of a horticultural therapy program. HT has also been found to help with those with intellectual disabilities, improve social functioning and job related physical skills uh, when it is used as a form of occupational therapy. So that's from Sun et al. in 2022. So you can see there's a lot of really good applications for this to be sort of a really broad and enveloping uh, modality for therapy. I know in counseling, we're always really big on our acronyms. So here's one that is um, sort of a standard. And again, these are just guideposts, suggestions. Any of this can be customized. But here's one that is standard from within horticultural therapy, and that's uh, plant people. Uh, you know, sort of driving home that uh, person, plant, plant, person uh, interrelatedness. Some of the goals for a HT program could be uh, participate appropriately, explore the wonders of nature, observe the patterns of nature and parallels to life. You know, you can use plants as sort of an extended metaphor for, you know, uh, growing, healing, moving through adversity. Uh, we'll talk more about that on the next slide, though, because we've got observe the patterns in nature and parallels to life. So this can also be used as sort of a mindfulness uh, and the sort of intentionality practice, something to help in, uh, improve focus and improve concentration. One of the things that people often find very challenging or tedious about gardening, uh, how the attention to detail and just how many repetitions it takes of doing the same things, the same movements over and over. And that can actually be one of its great strengths because that can help improve your ability to focus. Uh, practice skills or techniques, learn about myself, about plants, and about life, experience a new way of being that includes acceptance, very, very big as a, a positive psychology underpinnings of HT, plan ahead, listen to others, advocate for myself, narrate a new chapter, and transition into the next stage of life effectively. That all is from uh, Holler et al. 2019. And then uh, we have some interventions. So these are some very common plant-based interventions. Now, uh, these are just, again, broad strokes. One of the sort of issues with HT is that there is not like a regimented or standardized protocol for interventions. So these are some that are commonly used, uh, have been shared among different HT and counselor dyads. Um, one that I find especially useful, especially as a warm-up or a daily check-in, uh, I'm calling Pick-A-Plant. 
and basically you choose a plant that represents how you're feeling for the day either you know physically or emotionally mentally could be a combo could be pick one that you know represents how you feel physically pick one that represents how you feel emotionally and it's a good technique for disarming it sort of works in uh, a similar manner to like play therapy or expressive arts therapy for people who are having a hard time putting into words or expressing themselves through traditional talk therapy. It also gives you a chance to use that extended metaphor to talk more about their life in an abstraction sort of way. And you can combine it with things like CBT, uh, looking for and sort of debunking these different possible cognitive distortions uh, that your client may have. You can also use plants as an extended metaphor for uh, healing. And uh, that also goes along with, you know, potting, uh, reprodding, pruning, propagating, all that sort of goes together. You, you sort of use an extended metaphor to talk about how, you know, plants like, like people know how to put themselves back together. They know how to heal from trauma. They know how to grow and thrive if they're given the proper conditions. And it sort of gets really Rogerian in that sort of, you know, way of, of looking at things. You know, if you provide an environment for healing, your client will thrive. Um, but it also gives you a chance to discuss some of those things with your client and talk about things like post-traumatic growth, how pruning is not just important for how we shape the plant to make it more aesthetically pleasing for us, but also in a, in how that um, for proper healthy growth for the plant and also to really produce flowers and fruit uh, pruning or uh, deadheading as it's commonly called is a crucial part of the process. Some other interventions include harvesting or collecting, um, seed sowing, and that can also be uh, from collected seeds as a part of the harvesting process, or sensory plant exploration. And I, I really like the use of a sensory garden because uh, it's really multifaceted and can be really customized to what your client needs. For example, if your client is uh, experiencing you know higher levels of uh, stress, you can use it as a distress tolerance or even a de-stressing sort of tactic, especially if you're using aromatic plants, you know, like uh, lavender or cedar or sage, um, because there's such a strong link between sense and memory, you can sort of hijack that pathway uh, for sort of remembering that you can be calm even when you're in a stressful situation just by using those scents to sort of help activate those pathways. Also because of the link between memory and sense, uh, this is also a technique has been found to be very good with people who are sort of struggling with memory loss. And while the primary focus for the patient is on the process, not the products, uh, ideally, when you set up these programs, we want it to sort of be a win-win situation where there can be benefit for both the client, but also for the institution, for the community, for the environmental context uh, within which the client is embedded. Uh, again, looking at that uh, healing factor and reducing that uh, sense of uh, social isolation and uh, those feelings that you are uh, not able to contribute anything for the uh, betterment of your community. And that comes from Holler at all 2019. Um, but like I was saying, there's yet to be any kind of standardized uh, HT protocols developed using a randomized controlled trial. And so the research still needs improvement both for um, practitioners to help increase our efficacy, but also to help uh, validate its usage. And that's from uh, 2 of 2022. There are several different contextual models for horticultural therapy. Um, right now we've been focused more on the mental health models, which would include a focus on wellness. However, it also goes into uh, physical well-being, 
because there's lots of good benefits like that. Exercise, horticultural therapy, um, uh, sort of a fun context for exercise. Uh, it also, like we've been saying, helps increase social interactions and social integration. And so that's also a key part of just your overall well-being, being able to um, sort of get those social interactions. And of course, the stress reduction also is a key benefit for the wellness side of HT. Um, usually wellness programs are incorporated as part of um, larger services like uh, inside community outreach programs. Uh, many residential programs uh, are starting to incorporate more horticultural therapy, um, especially um, those programs that are working with people who have developmental disabilities uh, because of the combination of exercise and social interactions, but also with uh, people who are elderly and aging and starting to be less active and more uh, isolated, more showing symptoms of depression uh, because as their bodies age, they're not able to do what they used to do. So um, this folks on wellness can sort of like work some of that back into their day, just giving them, you know, a, a reason to go out and, and see people because uh, you get to be in the garden. Now there's also a key facet for vocational training within HT. Um, this would be, um, again, adjunctive working with a vocational counselor, working on workforce development skills. Um, horticultural jobs are numerous, uh, especially if you include uh, just general landscaping and having a little bit more knowledge than knowing how to mow, blow, and go can be a real asset for people who are looking for a little bit more specialized uh, care for their uh, lawns. It's also great to learn more competitive skills to help improve your job opportunities. And this is where a horticultural therapist can really help work with that vocational counselor and helping clients flesh out their resume, especially because a HT would have a really good grasp on what skills should focus on and how do you and what skills should be emphasized when writing that resume to get more attention from uh, possible employers. And then finally, the therapeutic uh, treatment context. Um, this can be both for mental health, but also for physical health. And again, these are adjunctive therapies, something that's added on as part of a multidisciplinary team. We talked about some of the benefits for the client, but it can also help with uh, diagnosing. In addition to treatment, you can help assess what clients' needs are and also see uh, some of their strengths and resources. For example, maybe they enjoy being outside. Maybe um, when just holding a plant, they, 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 you notice the client smiles a little bit more. Maybe, maybe the client's more willing to interact with others if they're able to give them something like, look at this plant that I just propagated, that, that sort of thing. And then um, for physical use, it goes hand in hand with that exercise, that wellness. But it can also be, um, I don't know, is it more, more fun, more engaging. Uh, use your injured side, use the side that you've lost functionality in to build up strength by watering plants instead of, you know, doing bicep curls and reps and reps and reps and things that, again, just aren't fun to do. This gives a bigger context for building back strength and helping heal. Um, it also helps reduce some of the negative effects of obesity, not just in mitigating some of the symptoms, but also can be useful because of the exercise for helping uh, reduce weight in a healthy way and also offset some of the negative effects of neurodegenerative diseases and just aging in general. So these are all different contexts for horticultural therapy, working with uh, counselors in other fields. And now we move into the research update portion of the presentation. The first study I would like to highlight for you is from Mortished and Gisoni. Uh, was published in 2021. Uh, this was research done with uh, group treatment for veterans who had returned from service and were diagnosed with PTSD rather than working in a confined environment, which they found to be kind of 
triggering, they were sent to work on a farm. And so they're working together in a group setting, um, gardening, growing things together, and then sharing meals together using what they had grown in that garden. And the togetherness is a really crucial part of this study. Uh, it sort of relies on that uh, theoretical understanding that, uh, especially with veterans, you know, they, they serve together and so they are hurt uh, together as a group. They're, they're emotionally, that's, that's, where they're, that's where they were hurt. That's how they were hurt. And so the main vector for healing also comes from a group togetherness setting. Now, this study was done with uh, younger vets who had recently returned home, so they were a little bit more, uh, well, they were, they were still very physically fit. And so one of the things that they were incorporating was uh, similar to exercise therapy because it's built into gardening with tasks that are very physically demanding, such as mulching or composting or dragging straw around and applying it to different garden beds. Uh, modifications can be made for patients who have weakened cardiovascular or skeletal muscle um, due to, you know, uh, injury or damage or even a habitual substance uh, use. And um, this physicality is actually something that we've used a little bit down with Community Roots. We've done some work uh, both with uh, students in an emotionally disturbed classroom, so that's a special ed uh, setting for students who qualify with uh, emotional and behavioral goals as a part of an individual education program, and also working with an institution that is in the neighborhood with our therapeutic site. Uh, it's called the Knox Learning Center, and it's sort of a uh, alternative education setting. It's primarily for students who have been expelled from their school or uh, sent there usually permanently on a year-to-year -year or indefinite basis. Um, and a lot of those students are carrying a large amount of trauma and uh, some of them are carrying a large amount of, of, of anger and that tends to uh, get in the way you know when, when you're really uh, amped up uh, it's a lot harder to learn or focus or grow or heal and something has to be done with that energy um, some of it can be due to the calming nature of a uh, natural horticultural space but sometimes you people need a task sometimes people uh, need to sort of you know work through that and then burn it off as it, as it were and that's something that we found to be pretty effective for that population just in my own again a very anecdotal experience um, the other thing that was interesting to come out of the Mordeshed and Gisoni study is um, just that the focus on using nutrition and exercise to uh, reduce maybe not even eliminate but in in this case the goal was to eliminate uh, the need for long-term or lifelong psychopharmaceutical treatment uh, they were looking for a way to heal and work through uh, their trauma that did not involve uh, prescription medication and this study had some really good results on overall well-being and mental health for uh, returning veterans and could be a, a very interesting sort of gateway to more research into specifically looking at how HT can be incorporated into part of a treatment plan for our veterans returning home. And the second study I would like to highlight for you is uh, by Rivera Lopez. This is actually part of their graduate capstone. It was a research project using people who were uh, receiving inpatient treatment for substance abuse disorder. They were at a residential facility and most of them, all, most of the participants also had, uh, let's say, experience with the criminal justice system. 
Um, so they uh, had participants who were in that system participating in a gardening project. Uh, many of the participants, in fact almost all of them, found it to be a very positive experience. They uh, said that they felt better about sort of who and how they were uh, at the end of the program and they felt that it helped give them an outlet for um, energies that would have otherwise gone into drug-seeking behaviors. One of the keystones of this study uh, were similar with the veteran study using uh, physical labor uh, with increased social interactions. And so uh, not only does that work on those interpersonal skills, your ability to sort of, you know, get what you want by being uh, able to work together as part of a team, but also because of that increase in social interaction can lead to a sense of more community involvement and help reduce those feelings of isolation and separation that are commonly part of inpatient treatment for substance use disorders. The uh, very uh, famous Rat City study comes to mind when thinking about this sort of thing. Due to the uh, required teamwork and collaboration, HT is also a really good gateway to help people who have been isolated from society uh, learn different skills that will help them uh, reintegrate within the general society. So not only are uh, people in these sorts of programs and uh, treatment plans able to learn skills that could help them be employable through uh, horticulture, but they're also just learning general skills to help them sort of fit in better with society than they were uh, before so that when they come back we have a better shot at uh, reduced recidivism and not having these uh, people continue to i guess enhance their experience with the criminal justice system and that's where both of those studies uh, are really kind of new and really sort of serve more as a pilot a sort of gateway to say hey we we need more research so we need a lot more research, especially with the treatments for PTSD and for substance use disorders. Um, it's still limited to, uh, and most of HD really has a large amount of anecdotal data. And without standardized protocols, we can't really uh, we can't really study these facets in a way that really helps you know get robust statistics. Uh, in addition to that, most of these studies tend to not really be using randomized controlled trials, um, and those that do um, have some experimental design issues, um, would require better blinding protocols, just things that we can point to and say, see, we told you, those, those things we said work, that they work. Even the most recent systemic review, uh, 2023 by Lou et al., found these same issues, a need for greater randomized control trials, uh, greater blinding, um, follow-up, longevity studies, uh, but they also called for a comprehensive guide for operations. That way we have an understanding and can clinically validate these different protocols. And especially as, you know, more and more um, health care becomes managed care, especially with respect to mental health. Having the evidence and the data on your side really helps to improve the ability to tell an MCO, like, hey, this, this is an evidence-based practice. We can use this, we use it effectively, and we use it um, even if not as a replacement for psychopharmacology, but as a way to help supplement and reduce a person's reliance on what could potentially be a lifetime of having to take drugs to help them get to a place where they are okay. And of course, as everyone's favorite part of any presentation, the references slide. So I have uh, two slides of references, just in case you want to uh, investigate them. Feel free to pause the video. Uh, these are also all included in your handout. So you uh, have links to all the DOIs and any of the websites that I was drawing information from.
And now I'd like to take a look back and reflect on how I did with this presentation. Uh, do you feel like I did a good job um, presenting you with the basics of horticultural therapy, uh, focusing on the, the need to standardize our protocols and interventions? And you should feel like you had a nice, just a little taste of uh, some of the more recent research, especially working with uh, veterans and also those uh, working through a substance use disorder. I feel like I did a pretty good job really driving home the importance of more research in this field. Please ask me any and all questions that you may have. This is linked on the forum, so please uh, put those questions as a reply below. Or you can also address any questions you may have directly to me, spatters10 at walsh.edu. Thank you guys so much for giving me your time and watching this presentation. Uh, I really look forward to your questions and also to your feedback on the forum. So thank you.